so that's going up and then I work out what's on there but then I was in the houses and that's coming up or an option. Yeah,
Good morning and welcome to worship at Collins Street Baptist Church. Welcome to those who are here sitting on those pews and to those of you who are watching online. The psalmist invites us, sing to God's name, play hymns, God rides the clouds, send up a song, Lord is God's name. Rejoice. And we will do exactly that by singing this wonderful doxology written by Ross Langmead that we learned last week and we're going to sing it again. Creator of this great land, we adore you. And David Cundy has kindly put the music notes on the slides. Those of you who are sitting a fair way back, you may strain to see them. So this is the opportunity to move closer to the front. Don't worry if you don't read music, just see the direction in which the notes go, whether they go up or down, and that tells you where your voice should go. And that's probably enough information from me. So we're going to sing the melody through together twice. There is a descant, which we will sing through twice. And then David says that it would be good if we divide up after that. And those uh, who would like to sing the melody will sing the melody. And those who are feeling particularly confident to sing the descant. And we will make a joyful, harmonious noise together. So I, I think we need to stand. Uh, you'll be sitting for long enough. Uh, unless I manage to cut the sermon a bit shorter, which may not be a bad idea. So, take it away, David, and Kyrene on the strings, and we have Neil to uh, sing, uh, to guide us and lead us in our singing. Thank you, Neil. It's a beautiful, beautiful song. 
a Trinitarian hymn, as you will notice, sung in praise of God the Creator, Jesus the Renewer, and the Spirit who is the transformer of all life. Let us pray. I pray using a prayer based on Psalm 68, the psalm for today, written by Jim Cotter in his book on the Psalms. We praise you, O God, for your power, for the way of, the, of Jesus Christ. Like your people of old, we delight in you, glad of the home and the land which you give us which you put in our hands to care for. We sing to you, O God, we sing praise to your name. We give you the glory in the midst of our desert, for you come with living water to dry and thirsty ground. Let us see you again as you come to us. You came contracted to the span of a child, helpless in the arms of his mother, compassionate in bearing while pinned to a cross, taking the trampling of blood deep in the heart of your being, breaking the barrier of death to new and glorious life. And so we fall silent, O God, before the mystery of love, this renouncing of power familiar so long, this reversal of power that none can defeat, this wonder we can scarcely believe. We praise you, O oh God. Amen. I greet you with the peace of the Lord. May the peace of the Lord be with you. And please extend that peace to one another. Good morning everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name's Catherine and I'm a member and deacon of the church and I'd like to join with Marita to welcome you warmly to our service this morning, particularly to any visitors who are with us. We have some visitors from New Zealand and also from Zimbabwe currently living in Camberwell, so warm welcome to you. Please join us for tea or coffee after the service and we'll encourage you on this beautiful spring morning to take your drinks outside onto the veranda, please. And we also welcome those who are not with us in the sanctuary today, but following us online at home. So today is Marita's final Sunday as our interim pastor. She has been with us through the winter months and I've, I'm sure you will join with me in warmly thanking her for her care of us through these last two months, which she has done with such generosity and wholeheartedness. Marita, can you stand? <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Marita. It's, I, I feel she's really shown us how to be with the church. And, Thank you, and we wish you well as you return to the pews from next Sunday. <laughs> um, so our pastor Simon will be back next week. Um, he's actually travelling back today, arrives back in Melbourne this evening, all being well, and we'll be straight back into it. You may remember there's a group of city centre Baptist pastors who've been meeting regularly for years, and they have their meeting Monday and Tuesday this week, so I hope the jet lag will be kind to Simon as he goes straight back to that. And next Sunday we'll have a service of communion, which is fitting to welcome him back. 
We turn now to our offering. Many of you give online and we're grateful for that. We also have two offering bowls at the top of the aisles there if you want to contribute to those at the end of the service. But let's pray together. Generous God, all things were created through you and in, in you all things exist. We turn to you this morning and ask that you accept the gifts we offer now. Our money, our time, our brokenness, our hope, our risking, our lives. Bless and transform all that we offer and all that we hold back, that new life may be ours to celebrate and share. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us hear the words of this song from centuries ago, preserved through the Jewish scriptures, Psalm 68. God rises up, enemies of heaven scatter, they disperse like smoke, they melt like wax, they perish before God. But the just are glad, they rejoice before God and celebrate with song. Sing to God's name, play hymns. God rides the clouds, send up a song. Lord is God's name, rejoice. Father to the fatherless, defender of widows, God in the temple. God gives the homeless a home, sets prisoners free to prosper. But the rebellious are banished to the wild. God, when you led your people, when you marched in the desert, earth shook, heaven reigned before you, Israel's God, the Lord of Sinai. You gave us downpours to refresh the promised land where you nourish your flock. Gracious God, you strengthen the weak. God speaks a word a company of women spreads the good news. Kings and their armies run and flee. Housewives and shepherds all share the plunder. Silver-plated doves with bright gold wings. The almighty blue kings about like snow on Mount Zalman. Bless the Lord each day who carries our burdens, who keeps us alive, our God who saves our escape from death. People watched the procession as you marched into your house, my Lord, my sovereign God, singers at the head, musicians at the rear, between them, women striking tambourines. Use your strength, God, as you did for us in the past, from your house above Jerusalem. May rulers bring you gifts, Rulers of earth, sing to God, make music for the Lord, who rides the clouds, whose voice is thunder. Acknowledge the power of God, who governs Israel, whose strength is in the storm clouds. You inspire wonder in your temple, God of Israel, as you fill your people with power and might. Blessed be God. The Lord is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path.
During this winter season of July and August, we have been reflecting on the Book of Psalms. The Book of Psalms is a treasure trove, as you well know, and a central resource for praise. In the Bible, in the Jewish synagogue, in the church. For Psalms speak about human experience in an honest and freeing way. There is no cover-up, unlike much of what goes on in our worlds today. As the wonderful biblical scholar Walter Brueggemann writes, the Psalms assure us that when we pray and worship, we do not have to deny the deepness of our own human pilgrimage, but to submit it openly and trustingly in passionate speech addressed to the Holy One. Well, today I had been hoping that uh, my colleague from Whitley College, the Re Dr. Mark Brett, would have been preaching, but uh, alas, he has been struck down with illness and was not well enough to come. So I thought, right, I will choose a psalm. Which one will I choose? And some of us remember hearing Sean speaking a few weeks ago about how inspiration led him to choose Psalm 40. It was a great story, so Sean, we still remember it. And the U2 concert. Uh, I read a few Psalms through, and this one leapt out at me. Why? Quite simply, because there are lots of references to women and allusions to women. And uh, women don't always get a good guernsey in the scriptures. In a patriarchal world, we don't always learn the names of women. Women are there in the background, essential, of course, to the whole of life. But I like the fact that this psalm um, brings women forward, front and centre, and there they are. And they're also alluded to. So you wouldn't necessarily know unless you checked out some of the allusions and some of the kind of references that are sitting there causing us to look at other parts of the Bible. Well, time doesn't permit to go into all of those allusions, but I will mention them in passing. We have references to the widows and the orphans, the homeless and the prisoners, the widows, the women spreading the word, housewives and shepherds sharing in the plunder, women playing their tambourines in the procession to the temple. So they're there in all sorts of roles, at home and in public. Hmm. Had I made a wise decision, however, choosing Psalm 68? Now, you may be glad that Neil did not read the whole psalm because it is a little bit longer than the verses that you saw there on the slides. Uh, and I did leave out a few of the grisly bits. There are some nasty bits. And we don't want to entirely overlook those because they are actually the very real experience of people back then and now. Commentary research was not particularly encouraging to my choice, as I discovered. One commentator said that Psalm 68 contains some special features that have attracted and continually challenged exegetes. And I thought, as I read further, that commentator was not kidding. It is infamous, the commentator says, or famous, because of its difficult text. And this is a reference to the different um, uh, Hebrew words which have been translated into Greek in various ways. Another scholar said, this is a complex psalm in terms of its composition and process of transmission. Scholars consider Psalm 68 includes some of the earliest poetry we have in the Psalter, in the Book of Psalms. In other words, it goes back a long way and it's put together over perhaps hundreds of years into the form that we have in our scriptures today, drawing upon the different experiences of the people of God throughout their journeys, throughout their pilgrimage 
throughout their life, their lives of faith. There are rare words, elusive language, shifting styles. It contains traditions that go back a long way, well before the temple in Jerusalem, before King David, back before the time of exile. But it clearly includes references to that time in Jerusalem and then during exile and after exile. So it's a snapshot, if you like, of a very long story, which is really perhaps better suited to the big screen. I think a film could have been made out of this, or perhaps it already has, of the, the kind of Lord of the Rings type, with its mythic poetic proportions. Anyhow, I persisted in my reading and research. I left out the particularly gruelling violent bits on purpose, even though we know they act like a refrain throughout the whole of the psalm. How is God known in the psalm? So many appellations, so many descriptors. The father of the fatherless, the defender of the widows, the one who shelters the homeless and who sets the prisoners free, who led the people through the wilderness, who sent rain, who nourished the flock and strengthened the weak, who carries our burdens each day, who keeps us alive, who saves, who puts down the mighty, and on and on it goes. That's reason enough, isn't it, for choosing this psalm? And it does warrant further examination. It was a psalm likely sung at many festivals, celebrating God as king and God as deliverer, celebrating God's providence. It's a song or a psalm used in a procession, hence the reference to the musical instruments and the women beating their tambourines. There are different names for God in the Hebrew that are used in this psalm, translated as we do, but names like Elohim, Yahweh, and the abbreviated version, Yah. Lord of all is also used. It's a hymn, no surprises there. It belongs in a cluster of four hymns, Psalms 65 to 68. And it concludes with the words, blessed be God. This psalm, together with the one that goes before it, underscores God's help. And the one that comes after it, together with this psalm, really underlines a theology of the poor. These psalms praise Yahweh the Lord for his help and kindness, that God rules the depths of the sea where the poor are found, that the righteous poor stand at God's side. They are not accursed, as some traditions would have had it. And there are definite allusions to Psalm 68 in the New Testament. Because we know this was the Bible of the early Christians, the Old Testament, the Psalms, front and centre in their worship, before they had access, as we do, to the New Testament. Psalm 68's kind of made up of a, a lot of little bits, four big bits, or some scholars think nine little bits. You can explore that further at home if you wish and do a bit of digging. But the psalm begins and ends with a summons to sing praise to God, the rider upon the clouds of heaven. And I think this kind of might suggest some of those amazing science fiction movies. The rider upon the clouds of heaven. What's that all about? Well, we'll explore that in a moment. The poetry calls on God to bring about the utter downfall of the wicked, those who hate God and everything about God. And they are depicted as insubstantial, unstable, transitory like smoke and melting wax. Arise, O God, let your enemies be scattered and your foes flee before you, are words we find early in this psalm. And they're words that are used in other parts of the Old Testament. They're used when the ark of the Lord sets out. Not Noah's ark, a different kind of ark. The ark, that sacred symbol of God's guidance and protection, 
that was taken or carried by the people on their journey through the wilderness, that which contained the Torah, the law of God, God's wisdom, God's guidance. Verse 4 underscores the motif of joy. The just are glad, they rejoice before God and they celebrate with song. And the psalmist calls on the community to praise God. Referring to God as the, the rider on the cloud, the cloud rider, or some translators, the wilderness rider, signifying the presence of God with the people, with people, wherever they are, as they are on the move. To understand that illusion more clearly, we need to know something about the religious world of the ancient Near East, where the Canaanite god Baal was known as the storm god, the rider of the clouds, the fertility god who did battle with primeval forces to restore the earth's fertility, who gained victory and the right to kingship and royal residence. And that background knowledge helps us understand why the psalmist depicts Yahweh in that fashion, that Yahweh is the mighty divine warrior known in the thunder and the rain, whose armies are thousands of heavenly chariots. It's poetic, mythical language. There's a great mythical battle going on. And in contrast to Baal, Yahweh is the cloud rider who brings help to the vulnerable, who brings the people through the wilderness, who brings rain and prosperity, whose name is the Lord, Yah, shortened version of Yahweh, meaning thou. Hallelujah. Thou. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thou. For this God is present with the people, with the people back then and the people now, enacting justice, leading to shelter those in need, in contrast to the desert that awaits the wicked. In a patriarchal world where widows and orphans were particularly vulnerable, where they found their security and their identity from their relationship to the males in their lives, woe betide them if those men let them down or died, abandoned them or abused them. But God, Yahweh, is the protector. It's very clear. The one who protects widows and orphans. I think these affirmations are very pertinent in our society. We're aware today that the move to legislate against coercive control, a move to have states across Australia have the same regulations and policies in this matter, has gained momentum. And this is been very necessary and a long time in coming. Sadly, too late for so many lives lost every week from domestic abuse. So many women killed. Coercive control is the common denominator of domestic or family abuse, whether or not that control escalates into physical violence, which sadly it often does. This coercive control robs its victims of their human agency, their capacity to live with freedom and independence, to live without fear of the consequences. And the God whom we worship and whom we praise and who is known to us in Jesus is the one who defends the widows and the orphans, the homeless and the lowly, the lonely who are also singled out in this psalm. Those who did not have a clan or a tribe or a family to protect them and their rights. Today, refugees, asylum seekers, those whose family members have abused or abandoned them. Young people living with disabilities, with mental health issues. All of these singled out as a particular object of God's loving care. I know that some of you attended David Chen's funeral, 
or memorial service to be more accurate, at Sindel Baptist on Friday. And some of us watched it online. David, as uh, many of you know, was the last remaining life deacon of this church, Chinese. He came from mainland China, the People's Republic of China, soon after the communist regime. He had been studying medicine and his studies were cut short as he moved to Hong Kong and then eventually came to Australia. It was not possible for him to continue his medical studies. He did a building course and he learned how to build restaurants, Chinese restaurants as it happens. And from that building, he learned how to cook Chinese food and how to run restaurants. And he became a significant figure on the Melbourne landscape in that whole area of Chinese cuisine. But not only that, David Chen was very generous with his money, his resources and his know-how. And he assisted many who came to this country from other places to get established, for he knew what it was like to be a foreigner in a foreign land. He was living out the affirmations of this psalm. A friend of the strangers in this land, because that is indeed what he had been. He was a JP for 46 years, whom the police often called on to help when they had detained a person in the police station for interview. He was a friend to many. I know he was a good friend to some of you here. I could go on in this psalm, but I'm not going to, not for too long anyway. In the central part of the psalm, what we have is a retelling of the story of the salvation of Israel. It's a salvation history. It's about the people reminding themselves about what God had done for them, uh, how God had led them out of uh, slavery in Egypt, through the wilderness, out of exile into a promised land, how God had accompanied them on the way and put down their enemies. And the language at times is brutal, it's military, and we have to understand it in its context. But it is a reminder that the people did not want to forget what God had done for them. And I wonder if we are asked to tell our salvation history, our story of how God has acted in our lives. I wonder what we would include in that story. The people of Israel remembered that they were a lowly people, lost, needy and dependent, and for whom God provided a dwelling place. And they repeated their memories time and time again. What would you include in your story? If you were putting this section of the psalm into your own words, I wonder how you would write it. I might include the fact that I had a, a mother and a grandmother who were people of faith and prayer. That I had the opportunity to be taught by some good Sunday school teachers, people of faith who helped me, who didn't turn me off the scriptures, as I know was the experience of some. I might include the fact that at school I had a very good teacher, literature teacher, English teacher. I knew she was a Christian, but she didn't make a big deal about that. She was just a very, very good teacher, and I respected her. And then there were others that I met along the way and other experiences and opportunities that I had. I wonder what you would include. Points of transformation in your life? Moments that have been very tough? Turning points? People you've met? Something that's happened to you that stopped you in your tracks? An experience of worship? Of prayer? An epiphany, perhaps. What would you include in that story? And what would we as a church 
include in our story, a story that continues to be written as we reflect on the impact of COVID and lockdown over these last or past three years. Whatever we would include, it is so important that we take the opportunity to remember our salvation history, to affirm it when we gather here Sunday by Sunday or at home through the live stream, to show up, to share with our friends, our family, our community in ways they would understand what it is that is the reason for the hope that we have. Psalm 68 belongs to all the lowly and the humble who in the midst of this world remember and hope for the victory of God. It is a psalm that signifies our dependence on the saving power of God. It is a psalm that the women proclaimed having heard the word of God. It is a psalm that people sang, that they accompanied on all sorts of instruments. It is a psalm that speaks of the salvation of God, a song of salvation, if you like, which as followers of Jesus we know has been most fully expressed in his life, his death and his resurrection. And so together with the Apostle Paul, we may affirm these words from 1 Corinthians 15. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to stand and to sing, Spirit, open my heart to the joy and pain of living. As you love, may I love in receiving and in giving, spirit, open my heart. Let's stand.
bring our prayers of intercession to God. Let us pray together. O God, creator and redeemer of all things, today we pray for our world and people in every kind of need. We pray for the people of Pakistan, for the millions displaced by catastrophic monsoon rains, for the families of those killed. We pray for the response of humanitarian agencies and all those working to alleviate the situation. We name the ongoing conflict in Ukraine for the destruction of people's lives. We pray for a change of heart. May peace ultimately prevail. We pray for those in uncertain living conditions for refugees and asylum seekers, for the homeless, for those struggling to keep a roof over their heads. May we as a country and community work towards justice that there may be enough for all. We pray for our church here at Collins Street, for Marita as she steps back into the pews, for Simon, our pastor, and our staff, for our secretary Robert, our treasurer Laurie, our volunteers, and for all who build the church in this place. May we be servants to all. We pray for those in our community who are unwell, those in hospital or awaiting surgery, those anxiously awaiting tests to dis determine a diagnosis. We name them in our hearts. We pray for those who are not able to be here, but who participate online. We pray for our members who are feeling overworked and overwhelmed, and those who are lonely. For those who have recently been bereaved, and those who carry the sorrow of older griefs. We offer all our prayers, spoken and unspoken, and those we offer now as we come forward to light a taper, to you now, merciful God. Accept these prayers in the name of Christ our Saviour. Amen.
Thank you to those of you who have been so kind and encouraging to me. It has been a pleasure to serve you during this uh, two-month period. We uh, stand to sing our concluding hymn in a moment, uh, but I would just like to remind you that we have this wonderful place for prayer down the front, and if you would like to come down to that place and to light a candle or to sit quietly, it is there for you. Let us stand to sing.
brothers and sisters, go in the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And may the God of salvation place a song on your lips and in your hearts that will carry you forward this day and for all the days that lie ahead. Amen. Thank you.